Hi everyone, this is Dawn Winters and you are watching my series uh, called Writing for Doctoral Studies. This video is about organizing sources. So maybe you have clicked on this video first and you have yet to click on my outline video or my spreadsheet video or the concept mapping source uh, video um, and that's okay. This video is really all about thinking broadly and thinking kind of theoretically about how to organize your sources. It's not really a how-to. Uh, it's also not a this is how you should video. So my my whole theory or my whole approach is have a method in mind, have a system in mind before you get started. Um, there is no way that one person can tell another person this is the right way to organize what it is you're doing. If you have your system, if it includes taking over your entire office or your entire dining room or your entire living room with with piles of paper. If that's your system, if that's what keeps you organized, then, that, then that's what it is. Um, the problems arise when you don't have a system, when you haven't thought critically about how to organize what it is you're doing, and, and it will show and it will reflect in your writing. So this video is just a really brief video discussing how to get organized. So. Um, really, this is going to come up when you write your lit review. And, and what a lit review is, is a collection of research that is connected to the study at hand. I have limited in parentheses. The reason I say limited is you may be doing a study on, uh, let's say, on student retention, on, on higher education finance, where you're going to be able to find just a lot of historical research and a lot of historical data that are going to uh, really support what it is you're saying. You may, however, be in a field that really hasn't been explored a lot. So a field like social media or offices of parental uh, support on campuses, these are relatively new concepts, new ideas, new tools uh, that universities are exploring that you may not be able to find just a load of research to include in your uh, lit review. And that's okay. Um, really finding research that's connected to what you're doing and that sets a precedence for what it is you're doing, that's the purpose of a lit review. Um, and you're going to really want to stick to empirical research. I've discussed this in other videos, um, but empirical research is really first-hand research. It's not um, me looking up articles and including them in a synthesized way, uh, presenting them. It, this is uh, somebody or a group of people have done a study, they've directly observed, they've directly analyzed something, and they're producing results. Um, if you don't have an empirical study to include in your lit review, you're really going to want to evaluate it. If you've watched my How to Evaluate Sources, you'll know. Uh, you're really going to want to evaluate the author's ethos, uh, where the author is coming from, what the author or what the entity is representing, and really think, think critically about your sources. You still have to think critically about empirical research, but if it's been peer-reviewed, it's been verified, there's less critical thought and more just thinking, okay, that fits and I'm going to write it. And you're really going to want to think in your lit review about what I call inver inverted pyramid, which actually what everyone calls inverted pyramids. So you're going to want to narrow and have all avenues narrow down to your study. So what you're going to do is think about this visually. So um, if you've taken Dr. Miller's Research One class, or if you've taken Research One, or maybe you've been taught this before, that your research could be centered in a Venn diagram, right? So you've got a series of interlocking circles, usually three, where the middle of the Venn diagram is your study. That's one way to visualize it. Inspired by this, I kind of thought of it as I described to somebody, somebody I was working with, um, it's like if you order a pizza and they've got that little table that sits in the center of the pizza uh, that keeps the box from hitting the cheese. Um, that table is your research. The rest of those, those pie pieces that are coming in together, those are the portions of uh, precedence that will lead to your study. So off to the side here, you kind of have to tilt your head. Um, does attending a language school prior to university have an effect on the retention of students from China? So I've got a lot of ideas in this primary research question. I'm going to break it down into four. So first I've got retention, and this is overall retention at a university. Um, I also have international undergraduates. So not only are they undergrad, which undergraduates have their own sets of problems or I said challenges with uh, retention and, and universities do much to combat attrition issues. Um, but international students offer a subgroup. Well, 
it's not good enough to just say international students because, you know, a student who is from South America, who uh, has been speaking English for a while, who speaks Spanish, which has a lot of uh, English cognates, that person might, just with language, have a, uh, a bit of an easier time adapting to somebody from Saudi Arabia or somebody from China, where even the, the structure of the language, the building parts of the language are so different. So, you know, just thinking about international students as a giant conglomerate is already flawed thinking. We do it, but it's flawed thinking. So I'm going to also include a triangle that's students from China. So I want to really identify here are challenges, here are benefits of having students from China on campus, and here, here's what background information we need to know f about them that leads down to my study. Then you're going to want to look at attending a language school. So what do these language schools look like, especially those that are on campus? Uh, what do they provide? What kind of uh, structure, academics, and support and preparation do they offer to students? Um, so all of these are research avenues that you're going to want to start at least broadly discussing and narrow down to your research, which is that, uh, that blue star that's in the center of, of those uh, four triangles. So there are ways to organize each section. I've been saying broad to narrow, and that's what that inverted pyramid really represents. So you're going to look at education and culture in China and then how that affects American education. So you start off uh, in kindergarten maybe or start off with the general, here are the here's the Chinese culture and here's how it informs education. Most nationalized educational systems are direct reflection of a, natural, a national culture, a national idea, mores, norms. So you're going to narrow those down to, okay, how do these things inform a chi one Chinese student who comes to the U.S.? You can also organize it chronologically, so from past to present, early retention studies that build down to more recent studies. This really works with a theoretical base, so most theoretical frameworks have had at least historical groundings in something else or have gone through a couple iterations. So if you're using a model that was created two years ago, you may not have it, but if you're using a model that different people have had different takes on, you're going to have a lot of rich information to include in that uh, historical way to look at your, your research. You're also going to look at relevance. So you can start off with articles or with research that's not as relevant and work your way down. You don't want to include irrelevant information in your research, uh, in, your, in your chapter two. But you can include information that's only tangentially connected to your research and then work your way more to, here is this study that's nearly the exact same thing that I'm going to do, but here's the little twist or here's how I'm going to do it differently. And sometimes that just means location. A study that that was conducted on Chinese students who are studying in California, Oregon, and Washington is going to yield different results than, than Chinese students who are studying uh, here in Kentucky or even on the East Coast um, they, or in the Mid-South or in the South. Uh, the population of Chinese nationals who are living as citizens in the U.S. Um, is more concentrated on the West Coast than it is on the East Coast unless you're talking about New York or Chicago where there's uh, vibrant Chinese communities. But here in South Central Kentucky, here in the Mid-South, uh, the, the number of Chinese immigrants, the number of Chinese nationals that we have living as citizens in the U.S., um, they're, they're a little bit fewer and far between. So that's going to impact the differences. So it may just, again, you may be replicating a study, but just doing it in a different location with a different concentration and a different Chinese culture here in the U.S. And that might affect your relevance. Okay, so here are some ways to organize your research. And this is, I'm talking the physical copies of your research. So again, you're going to want to have a system. And you know, if you already have your outline or if you've done a concept map uh, that, that you've really thought about the sections of your chapter two, you can create files that are indicative of that chapter two. So um, I, I use files within files. So if I have a file that says retention studies, I open it up. I may have um, retention studies, historical ones. I may have ones conducted uh, more recently. And then I might have a file for uh, the few studies that were done with retention international students. Um, Within those folders, I'm going to name my files in ways that allow me to access them pretty quickly. So for here, if I have a retention article that's Smith 2015, that's going to go in my historical one, I will call it retention Smith 2015. If I have one on Chinese culture, China culture, Zhao 2010. 
if I have another one, uh, Feng 2011 on uh, Chinese education, I could call it Chinese education Feng 2011. I could also use a print file. And those of us in the doctoral program who, uh, you know, like to print, it does cause a lot of paper. It causes a lot of uh, damage to trees. Um, I, I don't recommend printing everything, but if you are just so connected to print that you really need to have that physical form, I suggest getting a nice file box. Aesthetics do matter, so if you've got something that's nice, something with color-coded folders that you can access readily, it'll allow you to um, really quickly access what you need to access and it won't clutter your house or it won't clutter your office. Um, see my videos on how to do an outline, how to build a concept map, how to uh, do an empirical research spreadsheet. Those will really offer you some guidelines on how to uh, organize the ideas that you find in those articles. So for more help on this, if you really still need someone to talk to about organizing your research, you can contact the Writing Center. You can talk to other doctoral students who are further along in the process. If you're looking for a system, uh, really seeking out help or just ask, simply asking you, how do you organize your life? How do you organize yourself? Can be a really big help. Here's some information about the Writing Center. I hope you've enjoyed this video.